Welcome to the deep dive. Ever wondered how the big picture of economics, you know, global markets, government stuff, how that actually connects to the choices you make every single day, like what you buy, how you spend your time? Mm. Well, you're in the right place. Today, we're diving into uh, really the foundation of it all. The first chapter of N. Gregory Mankiw's Principles of Microeconomics, specifically his 10 Principles of Economics. Yeah, this chapter is it, it, kind of like a fantastic preview, really. <laughs> it sets up the core ideas for understanding how any society deals with, well, the basic problem. Scarcity, limited stuff, unlimited wants. Right. So our mission today is basically to pull out the most important bits from this chapter. We'll explain the key concepts, the definitions, the examples Q uses um, just to help you get a solid handle on the economic way of thinking fast. Exactly. And it starts with something pretty fundamental. The word economy itself, it comes from the Greek oikonomos, meaning one who manages a household. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, society is like a big household, isn't it? Facing that same core challenge. Mm. Scarcity, we've got limited resources, time, land, people, machines, but we basically want everything. We just can't make it all. We really can't. And that's where economics comes in. It's defined as the study of how society manages its scarce resources. And these 10 principles, they're kind of our map. They guide us through how people decide things, how they interact, and how the whole economy works. Okay, let's start there with the individual. The first four principles are all about how people make decisions. Right. So principle one, people face trade-offs. This is huge. It's the basic idea that to get something we like, we usually have to give up something else we also like. You know the saying, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Exactly. Think about a student maybe deciding what to do Saturday afternoon. You could study economics or maybe psychology, or you could nap or work a few hours. Every hour on one thing is an hour you don't have for something else. Or think about parents deciding how to spend their income. You, you know, more on food and clothes might mean less for a vacation or less put away for retirement. It's constant juggling. And these trade-offs get even bigger at the society level, don't they? Like the classic guns and butter example. More spending on national defense, the guns, means less available for consumer goods, the butter that raise living standards. Precisely. Or consider environmental rules. Stricter pollution controls might give us cleaner air, which is great, but they also often raise costs for businesses. Right. That could mean lower profits, maybe lower wages, or consumers paying higher prices. So the benefit of a cleaner environment comes with a cost to, well, owners, workers, and customers. That really brings up a key tension Mankiw highlights, the trade-off between efficiency and equality. Can you unpack those a bit? Sure. Efficiency is about society getting the absolute most it can from its scarce resources. Think of it like making the biggest possible economic pie. Okay. Equality, on the other hand, is about how that pie gets divided up. Are the benefits distributed uniformly or fairly among everyone? So making the biggest pie versus slicing it evenly? Exactly. And yeah. the critical point is these two goals are often in conflict. Policies aimed at more equality, like, say, welfare systems or progressive income taxes, can sometimes reduce efficiency. How so? Well... They might reduce the reward for working hard, so people might work less, produce less. When the government tries to cut the pie into more equal slices, the pie itself might actually shrink. Just recognizing the trade-off is key for good policy. It doesn't tell you what to do, but it informs the decision. Mm, that makes sense. So if we're always giving something up, how do we measure that cost? Is there a specific term? There absolutely is. And that takes us right to principle two. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. This is where opportunity cost comes in. It's simply what you give up to get that item. Critically, it's not just the money you pay. Okay, like going to college. Perfect example. Tuition, books, sure, those are costs. But room and board, well, you'd have to pay for food and housing anyway, right? So yeah. that's only a cost to the extent it's more than living elsewhere. Yeah. But the biggest opportunity cost for most college students, it's their time. It's the wages they could have been earning if they weren't in class or studying. That foregone income is a massive part of the true cost. Yeah, you can see that really clearly with, say, top college athletes who could go pro. Oh, absolutely. They understand opportunity costs instinctively. Yeah. Giving up millions in potential earnings to stay in school, that's a huge opportunity cost. It really shows how this principle works in the real world. Okay, principle three then. Rational people think at the margin. First off, what's a rational person in economic terms? Is it just someone smart? Not exactly smart, but um, 
systematic. Mm -hmm. A rational person is someone who systematically and purposefully does the best they can to achieve their goals, given the chances they have. They weigh things up. Right. And they usually aren't making huge all or nothing choices. It's more like, should I have one more bite or study one more hour? That little bit extra. That's the key. Economists call that little bit extra a marginal change, a small incremental adjustment to what you're already doing. Think of margin as meaning the edge. So rational decision making means comparing the marginal benefits and marginal costs. OK, so comparing the extra benefit to the extra cost. Got it. Then Q uses some great examples here, like uh, streaming mm. movies. Yeah. Say you pay $40 a month for unlimited streaming and you watch eight movies. The average cost is $5 per movie. Yeah. But the cost of watching one more movie. Well, the marginal cost is basically zero, right? Except for your time. The money's already spent. Exactly. Or the airline example. A 200-seat plane costs, say, $100,000 to fly. That's $500 per seat on average. But if there are 10 empty seats just before takeoff and someone offers $300 for one... They should absolutely take it. Because the marginal cost of that one extra passenger, a soda, maybe a tiny bit more fuel, it's negligible. The $300 marginal benefit is way more than the marginal cost. Yeah. And this marginal thinking, it really helps explain that old paradox. Mm. Why is water, which is essential so cheap, while diamonds, which are frivolous, are so expensive. Mm. Yeah. Why is that? Because your willingness to pay depends on the marginal benefit. And that benefit usually falls the more you have of something. Water is abundant, so the benefit of one extra glass is pretty small. Okay. Diamonds are super rare, so the marginal benefit of getting one extra diamond feels huge. It boils down to you take an action only if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. That's a really clear way to put it. And it leads right into principle four. Mm -hmm. People respond to incentives. An incentive is just something that induces a person to act. Could be a reward. Could be a punishment. Mm -hmm. And since rational people are weighing those marginal co costs and benefits, well, incentives change the calculation. So people respond. If apple prices shoot up, you're incentivized to eat fewer apples, maybe buy pears instead. And apple orchards. They're incentivized to hire more workers and grow more apples because the reward is higher. Incentives are absolutely central to how markets work. And for policymakers too, right? You mentioned unintended consequences. Hugely important. Policymakers have to think about how laws change incentives or things can go sideways. The seatbelt example is classic. Explain that one again. Okay. So the direct effect of seatbelt laws is good. Mm -hmm. More people survive accidents if they're wearing one. But there's an indirect effect via incentives. If wearing a seatbelt makes accidents feel less costly, less risk of injury or death, Drivers might have less incentive to drive slowly and carefully. Ah, oh, I see. So they might take more risks. Potentially. Where? Sam Peltzman's 1975 study suggested exactly that. While fewer people died per accident, the number of accidents actually went up, the net result. Maybe little change in driver deaths and yeah. potentially even more pedestrian deaths because cars were being driven faster and less carefully. It's a stark reminder. Incentives matter often in unexpected ways. Wow, okay, that really shifts how you think about rules. So those are the principles for individuals. Now let's move on to how people interact. This covers the next three principles. This is where it gets really interesting. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. We often hear about, say, the US and China as rivals, like it's a game where one wins and one loses in trade. Yeah, that's a common misconception. But Mankiw says that's just wrong. Trade isn't like a sports contest. It can actually make both sides better off. Think about your own family. You don't grow all your food, make your clothes, build your house. Right. Not unless you're very unusual. Right. You specialize in something, maybe your job, and you trade your earnings for the things other people specialize in. This lets everyone enjoy a greater variety of goods and services at a lower cost. And the exact same logic applies between countries. When countries specialize in what they produce most efficiently and trade with each other, overall production goes up, and consumers everywhere benefit from more choices and lower prices. Trade allows for specialization, and that's beneficial. It really reframes competition as cooperation, in a way. In many respects, yes. Mutually beneficial cooperation. Yeah. Okay. And this idea of beneficial exchange naturally leads to principle six. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. We saw the alternative with centrally planned economies, like the old Soviet Union where government officials tried to decide everything. And it didn't work out so well. The idea was noble, maybe promote well-being for everyone, but the execution was flawed. In contrast, a market economy replaces that central planner with the decisions of millions of individual households and firms. 
all acting in their own self-interest, right? Guided by prices. Exactly. It sounds chaotic, but it often works incredibly well. This is where Adam Smith's famous invisible hand concept from the Wealth of Nations comes in. He noticed that when households and firms act in their own self-interest in markets, they are often led, as if by an invisible hand, to promote society's overall economic well-being. How does the invisible hand actually work, though? Through prices. Prices oh. are signals. They reflect both the value people place on a good and the cost of producing it. When you decide to buy something, you're looking at the price. When a firm decides what to produce, they look at the price they can get versus their costs. Prices adjust naturally to balance supply and demand, guiding resources to where they're most valued, usually without any central direction. So the implication is, if the government steps in and messes with prices, like with rent controls or heavy taxes, it can distort those signals and impede the invisible hand's ability to coordinate activity efficiently. That's a core reason why central planning failed planners just couldn't possibly gather and process all the information that market prices convey automatically. The case study on Uber really illustrates this, doesn't it? Compared to old-style regulated taxis with fixed fares and limited licenses. It's a fantastic modern example. Uber's surge pricing, where prices go up when demand is high, is pure invisible hand logic. Right. That higher price does two things. It incentivizes more drivers to get out on the road right when they're needed most, increasing supply. And it allocates the available rides to the people who value them most highly at that moment, the ones willing to pay the surge price. So it balances supply and demand in real time? Exactly. Hmm. Economists generally agree that it makes the market more efficient, reduces waiting times, and increases overall well-being compared to rigid, regulated systems. It shows the market adapting. Okay, but if markets and the invisible hand are so great, why do we need government at all? That brings us to principle seven. Governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. What's the role here? Well, the invisible hand needs a framework to operate in. First and foremost, governments are needed to enforce property rights. Meaning? Meaning ensuring that if you grow crops, they won't just be stolen. If you run a restaurant, customers have to pay. If you make a movie, people can't just copy it freely. Without secure property rights, people have no incentive to produce, invest, or trade, and the market breaks down. Makes sense. What else? Governments also step in to address market failure. That's when the market, left on its own, fails to allocate resources efficiently. Mankia highlights two main causes here. Okay. First is externalities. That's the impact of one person's actions on someone else who isn't involved in the transaction. The classic example is pollution. A factory might produce goods efficiently for itself, but the pollution harms nearby residents. The market price doesn't reflect that harm. And the second one. Market power. This happens when a single person or a small group has too much influence over market prices. Think of a monopoly like maybe the only, well, in a desert town. They could restrict water supply just to jack up the price. Right. In cases of externalities or market power, well-designed government policies like pollution taxes or antitrust laws can potentially lead to a more efficient outcome than the market alone would achieve. And there's also the goal of equality, right? Well, Not just efficiency. Absolutely. The invisible hand is focused on efficiency, making the pie as big as possible. It doesn't guarantee everyone gets a fair slice or even enough to live on. So policies like income taxes and social safety nets are aimed at achieving a more equitable distribution of well-being, even though, as we discussed, they might involve some trade-off with efficiency. But it's important to add the caveat, right? Government intervention isn't always the answer. Crucial point. Saying government can improve things doesn't mean it always will. Policies are made through political processes, which can be messy, influenced by special interests, or based on incomplete information. So analyzing policy requires comparing the imperfections of the market with the imperfections of government action. Okay, that covers how people interact. Let's zoom out now to the final three principles which deal with how the economy as a whole works. Right, the macro view. Principle eight, a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. The differences are just huge across the world. You look at average income in the US versus say Nigeria. It's staggering. It really is. We're talking about massive differences in quality of life, healthcare, nutrition, everything. And the explanation for these vast differences and for why living standards change over time is actually surprisingly simple. What is it? It almost entirely boils down to productivity. That's the amount of goods and services produced for each hour of a worker's time, or more generally, per unit of labor input. So countries where workers can produce more stuff per hour are richer? Essentially, yes. 
Higher productivity means a higher standard of living and the growth rate of a nation's productivity determines the growth rate of its average income. Things like strong unions or shielding industries from foreign competition. They might seem important, but they pale in comparison to productivity's impact on long-run living standards. So if policymakers want to boost living standards... They need to focus on raising productivity. That means investing in education, making sure workers have the best tools and equipment, and ensuring access to the latest technology. That's the fundamental driver. Okay. Next, principle nine. Prices rise when the government prints too much money. This is about inflation, right? An increase in the overall level of prices. Exactly. The book gives that wild example of Germany after World War I, where a newspaper price went from fractions of a mark to 70 million marks in under two years. Hyperinflation, a truly destructive example. And while the U.S. hasn't seen that, the high inflation in the 1970s caused major problems. So what causes this large-scale, persistent inflation? In almost all cases, the answer is simple. Growth in the quantity of money. When a government creates large amounts of money, the value of each dollar, or mark, or whatever the currency is, falls. Too much money chasing the same amount of goods. Precisely. If the money supply triples, but the amount of goods and services doesn't, prices will eventually triple too. Keeping inflation low requires careful control over how much money the central bank creates. Okay, final principle. Principle 10. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So we just said printing money causes inflation in the long run, but the short run is different. It's more complicated in the short run, yes. Most economists believe that over a period of a year or two, many economic policies push inflation and unemployment in opposite directions. How does that work? Well, injecting more money into the economy tends to stimulate spending. More spending means higher demand for goods and services. Okay. Faced with higher demand, firms might raise their prices, that's inflation, but they are also likely to hire more workers and produce more to meet that demand. More hiring means lower unemployment. Ah, so stimulating demand can lower unemployment, but at the cost of potentially higher inflation, at least temporarily. Exactly. This short-run trade-off is a key part of understanding the business cycle, those ups and downs in economic activity, like employment and production. Policymakers can try to influence this trade-off using tools like government spending, taxes, and controlling the money supply, but it's a delicate balancing act. It sounds like managing the economy involves navigating these often conflicting short-run and long-run effects. That's a huge part of the challenge, yes. Wow. Okay, we've really covered the core ideas here. Let's do a quick recap of these 10 principles. They seem like the absolute foundation. They really are. So first, how people make decisions. One. People face trade-offs. You can't have it all. Mm -hmm. Two, the cost of something is what you give up for it, opportunity cost. Right. Three, rational people think at the margin, looking at incremental changes. Yeah. Four, and people respond to incentives. That's crucial. Absolutely. Then how people interact. Five, trade can make everyone better off through specialization. Win-win. Six, markets are usually a good way to organize things, that invisible hand. Usually, yes. Seven, but governments can sometimes improve market outcomes, enforcing property rights or fixing market failures. Can, but not always will. Right. And finally, how the economy as a whole works. Eight, living standards depend on productivity, how much we can produce. Fundamental. Nine, prices rise when the government prints too much money inflation. Too much money chasing too few goods. Ten, and in the short run, there's that trade-off between inflation and unemployment. The business cycle trade-off. Phew. It's a lot, but it provides such a clear framework. It really does. And maybe a thought to leave you with. As you go about your day, watch the news, hear about economic policies, try to see which of these principles are operating underneath. Are the arguments you hear, the solutions proposed, actually aligning with these fundamental ideas about how people behave, how markets work, how the economy functions? It's a powerful lens. That's a great challenge. Apply these principles to what you see every day. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into Mankey's 10 Principles of Economics. We really appreciate you tuning in. From all of us here at the Deep Dive team, thanks for listening.